Hey, what's up? Today we're going to take a look at the new RSL Speedwoofer Mark II. Joe was nice enough to send out a review sample, as well as a set of their bookshelf speakers. I'll follow up with the speakers in a separate video. I really appreciate getting this sub in, as it's almost constantly been on back order since its release. Going into making this video, I was thinking, all right, let's review this sub. It should be a good performer. Version 1 was great, and this one has improvements. So what I really want to know is, is this the pinnacle of 500 and under subs right now? I'll save you the suspense. Yes. Yes, at least I think it is. Let's break it down and look into what makes this model so good and what improvements they came up with over their popular original Speedwoofer. What I really want to cover today is the general overview of my thoughts on the build quality as well as the performance. Uh, then how this sub stacks up against the competition, such as the SVS SB1000 at nearly the same price point as well as cover some of the spaces that a sub like this works best in. First, let's get the details out of the way. 22 to 200 hertz plus minus 3 dB frequency response. That's getting pretty low on a box this size, and they even point out 18 to 200 with room gain. But of course, this is highly dependent on your room. The driver is a 10-inch Kevlar reinforced paper cone with full anodized aluminum dust cap with high durability NBR surround. And let's take a look at the driver construction itself. It's obvious to me why so many feel this is the king of 500 and under. It actually has a really nice high quality driver. No stamped steel baskets or tiny motor sections here. You usually won't see this type of hardware on the budget units. Generally, if you open up a sub in this price range, you'll find something much lighter duty with a stamped frame. Definitely not something like this with a cast basket double stack motor, and a nice firm cone. So how about the cabinet? Well, it's basically a 15 by 15 cube, easily something you can integrate into your home without looking like you're setting up for a live Metallica concert. It comes in two colors, black and white. Both have a matte finish, and I don't expect either to cause any issues with reflections. So this cabinet is really heavy for its size. It's 40 pounds, close to 10 pounds more than the SB1000. A lot of that weight is in the cabinet construction. It has a one inch thick front baffle and three fourth inch on the rest of the enclosure. Things like this generally give you a pretty good indication they weren't skimping. This isn't your usual budget enclosure that sounds like a bass drum if you tap on the side. Another reason these have a lot of weight is the compression guide technology. It's a design that is supposed to dampen cabinet resonance. There isn't a lot of information out there about this, but it appears to function in a way that it uses different pressure zones, breaking up reflections. One byproduct of this is a very well-braced cabinet, which certainly isn't going to hurt anything. At the end of the day, you're left with a heavy, well-braced cabinet, and no one is going to complain about that. Well, unless you're making grandma move your subs around. Hello, we are trying to reach you about your car warranty. How about no? Or how about this one that hits home on this channel? Your spouse starts getting ads for all the things you shop for online. Like that expensive set of speakers you just bought. Do you know what a data broker is? It's a business that aggregates information from a variety of sources, processes it, and prepares it to sell to other organizations with the primary purpose of targeted marketing. In all likelihood, they know your birthday, your religion, your income, your address, your shopping habits, plus much, much more. Do you like the idea of random people, companies, or even hackers having access to your intimate personal data? I doubt it, and this is where the sponsor of today's video, Aura, can help. It will automatically send removal requests on your behalf during your free 14-day trial. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need, all inside of one app, too. Provide real-time alerts on your credit, like someone attempting to open a new credit card. A VPN that allows you to stay anonymous, keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. Virus, malware, and spyware protection on your computer as well as your mobile device. A password manager that can securely keep all of your information in one place. Aura even helps you manage what your kids can and can't do on their devices. Restrict apps, screen time limits, provide windows of use. Take your personal data back. Sign up today for a risk-free 14-day trial with my link HTTPS aura.com slash Koikendall. It's also linked in the description below. Give it a try and start to worry less. Now let's get back to the video. The port on these is kind of strange, right? It's far from the traditional round port you see on the majority of speakers and subs these days. According to RSL, it's shaped in this way to reduce airflow turbulence 
and perceived noise. The wider slot is built to distribute airflow better than a singular round port, allowing you better performance with the sub at a close proximity to the wall. I should point out that the version 1 had the slot in the front. I think this was a good move. It lessens the possibility of audible port noise. Flipping this sub around, we have the power light. Enough said there. We also have a wireless receiver button below that. This one is a little interesting as well. The receiver for wireless is already built into the speaker, but you need a separate transmitter. You can even run up to four subs at once with a single transmitter. That's a nice feature, I think. I like how they integrated the wireless receiver, so it's a simple and clean upgrade to move these over to wireless. Connecting up to four of them on a single transmitter, that's just a bonus. Below that, we have the crossover knob. The low pass also selects the modes. Turn it all the way to the left and you activate full range mode. This is what you would use in home theater for LFE mode. Turning it off does open up the range. You get a little more extension. If you want to see anything around 20 hertz, you likely need to have this switched off. It bypasses the crossover to use the one you have in your home theater receiver, for example. For two channel, you won't want to bypass this unless your equipment can handle that internally. We have a variable phase below that. A lot of times this is just a switch 0 or 180. This one allows you full control between the ranges for better integration control rather than essentially on or off. We have auto power below that. It goes into standby after around 20 minutes of inactivity. Next we have the inputs. I was happy to see the speaker level inputs. I dabble with vintage audio and a lot of times there isn't a line out available for a sub so this can make the ad integration a lot easier. To be fair the SVS offers this as well but only on their SP-1000. It's been phased out in the newer models. To the right of that, we simply have the LFE in and the common RCA inputs and outputs. Right here, we have a grounding screw for the unlucky with a ground hum. Not required, but it's there if you need it. Only other thing to note here is the input voltage. If you need 220, they have you covered. The switch for that is under this cover. No XLR, but honestly, that's not gonna happen at this price point, so I wasn't worried about that at all. So how does this actually sound? First off, the sub has great DSP limiters. I found you could really crank this one up without creating excess distortion. It felt like it was kept in check the entire time, so don't worry about playing a sub this size loud. It didn't get any wild noise that you would get with a sub that tends to lose control. Using the sub in LFE mode, there was a good weight to the bottom end. No issues with control. It doesn't sound like a booming mess at all, honestly. There's nothing worse than when your sub is loud but in reality, it just sounds like a thunderstorm with no accuracy or realistic output qualities. On music, the bass felt tight, didn't have any long overhangs that can make certain genres of music sound a bit sloppy. I generally avoid ported subs for music, but this one actually has a good deal of musicality. I felt it had that defined and accurate sound that I generally prefer from sealed enclosures. So now this is a big one. How does this compare to the competition? Let's start with an easy one, the Emotiva SE8. Uh, less output, a lot of similar features in a smaller scale. Is $100 more worth the upgrade to a speed woofer? Yeah, I really think it is. The features are similar, but the wattage, performance, and low frequency output is worth the upgrade in this case. It is bigger though, so if you need something really small, the SE8 is still a great option for something like near field listening. I enjoy that sub as well, honestly. Now for one that more people might be interested in. A close dollar for dollar comparison, the SVS SB1000. I have an SB1000, the non-pro version. It comes in at the same price as a Speedwoofer, roughly. The SVS has a larger driver, 12 inches, in a slightly smaller sealed cabinet. Head to head on amps, the new Speedwoofer beats it out by 100 watts. 300 on the SVS and 400 on the RSL. Frequency response on the SVS is 24 to 260 and 22 to 200 for the speed woofer. So we do get a little deeper extension, which is totally explainable by the port. Both of them have speaker level inputs, which I always appreciated on the SVS, opens up some doors for people into vintage receivers, and just another connection option that we see less and less of these days. The rest of the amp features will be similar. Both have selection to go into an LFE mode. I mean, the bottom line in this case is the RSL is more powerful, smoother, more precise and it goes a tad lower. Watching movies and listening to music sounds very natural with a dialed in crossover setting. While I like both these subs, the new Speedwoofer jumps ahead of the dated SVS model. The SVS Pro can likely put up more of a fight with its new driver and DSP settings, 
but still a smaller amplifier at 325 versus 400 in the Speedwoofer. But all in all, the 1000 Pro comes in at $600 and leaves our sub $500 price point we're looking at today. Another note, you pick these two subs up and you know the RSL has a serious cabinet and driver. The weight is around a 10 pound difference, which is a lot in boxes this small. What I think this really comes down to is the Speedwoofer just has more output than the SP1000 by quite a bit. You get a bit more mid-bass output from the SVS, but the deep extension is definitely with the Speedwoofer. The port is the main reason behind that. And I could compare the PB1000 since that will be able to match the Speedwoofer's extension, but it's a larger box. The SV1000 and Speedwoofer MK2 are somewhat closer in size. They're both cubes, and realistically, a lot of people are looking at subs that fit in their rooms. Not everyone is going to have a dedicated theater space, unfortunately. If we want to get crazy, I also have the SVS SB3000 and SB4000, but honestly, it's not a good comparison. Both of those models feature high quality drivers as well as much larger amplifiers, but they also come in at prices three to four times as much as a single Speedwoofer. So that's food for thought as well. Would you rather have a single SB4000 or multiple quality subs for a fraction of that price? If home theater is your thing, it's almost always better to have multiple subs. Even two channel listening follows the same principles. In fact, I have a pair of Sumiko S.9s in my main listening space. So what do I feel is the best fit for these? Well, let's start small. A small room or in an office near field listening, this will absolutely fill the room with next to no compromise. I'm used to full bass output having an SB3000 in my office space, so I was pleasantly surprised at how well the RSL did. Next, uh, a mid-size room, you can still get away with a single sub in a mid-size room. The output is strong, and with a proper placement, it should still load the room well. If you get into a large room, I'm gonna suggest a pair. Honestly, you can't go wrong with a pair in any size room. A pair of speed woofers will minimize all the seat to seat variances and bass responses. That way everyone gets the same experience. They also make it easy with the wireless option, so placement should be pretty simple. So what are my final thoughts on the speed woofer? I felt it had great performance for its size and it's just the right size where you can fit it just about anywhere. Another would definitely be the strong frequency response under 30 Hertz. This is really a highlight on this as many budget options fall apart here. I thought it had impressive build quality and driver selection. Just pick this thing up and it'll honestly surprise you. I think this one works well for home theater as well as music. Easily covers both scenarios for the majority of people. Now for the cons. I haven't really mentioned much for cons in this video and I honestly don't have much here. So let's just nitpick a little bit. The box is well constructed, but could use a bit of flair. Maybe a few rounder edges, I'm happy they put the money into the performance though. You can tell the budget went into the hardware. No PEQ or app features. This one is really nitpicking. Nothing at this price point offers it, but I'm still highlighting that it is a useful feature and I feel we'll see more and more of it in the coming years. So that's really it. If you wanna check them out, they do have a 30 day in-home trial. There is a $50 flat return fee, but I feel like that's acceptable, especially given the price they sell these at. The margin has to be pretty tight here, honestly. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. I have loads more content coming, including everything from vintage finds to DIY speaker builds. Have a good one and take care. See ya.